Atrial fibrillation. We're going to talk about atrial fibrillation today. My name is Joe DiMatteo of the Ask the Pharmacist group. Pharmacist, naturopath, clinical nutritionist, homeopath. Thanks for being with us. Difficult area. We've done tons of teaching in this area. Hopefully, um, you've benefited from them. Maybe if you haven't, uh, you can begin to just peruse and see what we have uh, on the YouTube site, Ask Joe DiMatteo. We have all different types of teaching, tons, everything from why water is important to why you need to detoxify to how to manage headaches and migraines better, what are the confounding factors uh, to non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And we're going to start talking about more in regards to disease states, not that we want to substitute this for your cardiologist advice or specific medical advice in, in regards to health, but I think a lot of folks... Um, when they are confronted with a disorder that is a disease state, begin to peruse the internet and you could garner some good information and you can garner some information that's not so good. And what I want to do is to bring light to what are legitimate factors, and you certainly need to talk to your physician and your cardiologist about this, but we're going to talk about what are the legitimate issues, what are the complications thereof? What are the problems that are associated with atrial fibrillation? What is it? And then what are some of the other factors that often is just not discussed? Confounding factors. So what is atrial fibrillation? Well, atrial fibrillation is basically, you can have um, rapid heartbeat, that's not atrial fib. You could have, I guess, supraventricular SVTs, that's technically not AFib. But what is, let's just focus on AFib. Um, AFib is where, see there's a portion of your heart, if I could just do this over here, that has what is called, it's a particular node. And the S, I believe it's the SA node, and there's an AV node, the atrioventricular, but the SA node, sinoatrial node, is up top. And from this, there, there are signals, in essence, that are sent, that are electrical stimuli that goes throughout a wave of, a, of an electrical current that, in essence, tells the heart to beat in a rhythmic fashion. So this is not so much about a rapid heart rate. This is about... A, a, an irregular heart rate. So what happens in atrial fib, there's, conf, there's mixed signals. You've got signals coming from the SA node where it's supposed to come. It's God-derived, God-ordained. This is what's supposed to happen. But often in this atrium, you have, especially where the pulmonary artery comes in, you have heightened activity where this, this area of the heart is super sensitized, and I believe I have some theories on this, but it begins to send out its own concurrent stimuli or wave association. So now you've got two competing factors where it's supposed to be coming from the SA node. Then your body's going into gyrations over here. And instead of a rhythmic pumping action and, ex and pulsation of the atrium, what you have is a equilibration or a fibrillation. So you have signal, signal, it doesn't beat with rhythmicity, it starts to equilibrate and you get these very short pulsed, not adequate expulsion of blood. Some folks don't have symptoms, they're asymptomatic, which is very bad because then the potential complications of atrial fib are blood clots that can form. And the more risk factors you have, such as heart disease, diabetes, hypertension, valve diseases, I've had heart attacks, bypass, the more comorbidities or other disease state orientations that you have, the greater your risk for clot. Obviously, if you don't have any of those and you're very healthy and it's idiopathic, they don't know what the source is, quote unquote, it's not coming from one of these, which we will cover in a moment then your risks certainly for clot go down. But depending upon what your medical advice is, they may want you to go on a blood thinner, not go into a blood thinner. But I want to kind of today not tell you medically how this should be treated, and I'll, I'll, I'll give you some thoughts about how it's treated, but to talk to you, why? Because it's such a big issue. There's, whew, there's a lot of people today with AFib, with atrial fib. Commercials all over TV on the medications to treat it, blood thinners to treat it. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. So, all right. 
let me, let me just step back. What are some of the risk factors? Well, you could have congestive heart failure. Your heart muscle is weakening. It's not pumping well. So it's overworked, puts you at a higher risk for AFib. You could have coronary artery disease, narrowing of the arteries. That puts you at higher risk for AFib. You could have had, God forbid, one, two, or three past heart attacks. Damage to the heart muscle puts you at a higher disposition. You could have had pericarditis, um, or I guess we'd call you know endocarditis, where there's inflammation of the lining of the, the, the heart. There's like a type of a cellophane lining, if you will, where bacteria can accumulate. There can be viral or bacterial assaults damages the heart, weakens the structure of the heart, puts you at a higher risk for AFib. You could have just come out of open heart or been in open heart or just recently had it. That puts you at a higher risk for AFib trauma to the heart. You could have damaged valves, higher risk. Now we get into the things that are not disease state, if you will, but obesity. Just You're just an inflamed individual. You eat poorly, you drink alcohol, you eat too much sugar, um, you just do not take care of yourself. You're under a ton of stress. You're producing a ton of inflammation, systemic inflammation. That puts you at a higher risk. There are certainly some genetic components to this. I don't think there's any question. But why does the heart go into this crazy counterbeat, creates its own issue, starting its own components? Well, again, let's jump down first to the complications. Blood, um, blood clots are number one. The other area is some folks just don't feel well. Uh, folks that have atrial fib often um, are very, get very lightheaded. They feel very weak. They feel fatigued. Uh, they feel um, like the, the plug's been pulled on them. There's a tremendous level of dysfunction that occurs. Some folks are very asymptomatic. Others, their lives are completely disrupted under attacks and bouts. Some, the heart not only goes into an irregular beat, that fibrillation, and it also, the rate goes up. So you could have a rhythm, atrial fib is more of a rhythm, so you could have a rhythm issue, right? But you could also have a rate issue. So some people, then when they go into atrial fib, then their rate goes ballistic. So there are medications to treat. Now the classes are different. The medications that are used to treat typically um, the class of meds that would be used as antiarrhythmics. Years ago, they used drugs like procainamide until it started creating a lot of joint issues and pseudo lupus arthritic type conditions. <clears throat> Quinidine was used for years, very short acting, little, can have a toxic effect on your body. More recent drugs, drugs like rhythmols and flecainides that are used to try to control rhythm, get the rhythm back. Sometimes the problem with these meds are they work for a period of time, but then the heart begins to remodel, begins to restructure. It kind of gets stuck into this atrial fib mode. And sometimes the meds after years stop working. So you've got rhythm control medications, then you've got rate. Often physicians might use beta blockers to control rate, slow down the rate. They might use calcium channels or beta blockers. Not major, major side effects. Some of those other medications that control rhythm do. They're more powerful drugs like amiodarone and profrenone. And there's another a brand new drug, I'm drawing a blank on the name, uh, that is in that family. These drugs have side effects. But you may not have a choice because atrial fib is life-threatening and potentially damaging. M not only does it take away the quality of your life, how you feel, because you're having these skipped or irregular beats and you feel as though you're not getting blood flow to the brain. Huge problem. Or you can develop a blood clot leading to a stroke, obviously a complicating factor. So number one, don't take it lightly. It needs to be treated. So maybe you don't have any of these scenarios. Maybe you don't have heart failure. Maybe you don't have coronary artery disease. Maybe you're not obese and blah, 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 and you don't have any of this stuff. Maybe there are some genetics. Maybe a parent or, you know, one of your ancestors battled this. And then I think that you have to begin to look at life issues. I believe there is some literature that shows that chronic stress over a long period of time opens the door. And this is what we would call catecholamine driven. So even personally for me, 
that I've had to learn that these catecholamine stress hormones, uh, we've got to get to a point in time in, your, when, in our lives where we begin to manage this stress better because these stress hormones are just being produced, is adrenaline, noradrenaline, these catecholamines are just being pulse through our body many times. Stress demands, I gotta be here, I gotta do this. I'm under the gun, I gotta get this done. Something, you know, my boss is in my face. I've got, I've gotta do this, I've gotta do that. I didn't sleep last night, I've got a presentation to get ready. I got issues, I got issues. Well, some of the literature shows that these catecholamines that are flooding into the heart in waves by the seconds times hours times days eventually begins to have an impact and some literature shows that it begins to change the myocytes, the little, the, the, your heart cells of the myocardium and they become more sensitized to these catecholamines, these stress hormones. So I guess without getting into a lot of detail, managing your stress is critical. I don't know, some deep breathing, pray, Read your Bible. Read Psalms. You feel overwhelmed. Things are getting crazy. You need to step back. Sometimes we just need to stop and take a couple of breaths in the course of the day. Um, tremendous amount of stress over a long period of time, I think, significantly predisposes folks to atrial fib. If you don't have those other underlying diseases and disorders. Next, excessive alcohol intake can be a trigger. Big trigger. For many of you, that needs to be brought under control. Uh, others, high caffeine intake. I'm not saying that alcohol gives it to you, caffeine gives it to you, stress gives it to you. These guys are triggers. This can open the door because of how it restructures and remodels, makes you more sensitive to the electrical current disruption. Literature also shows that folks that chronically use non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, ibuprofens, naproxens, and so on, and if you're addicted to those meds because of back problems, neck problems, um, you need to think twice. Because literature shows that folks that had recent use over the span of a couple of months have a much higher incidence of atrial fib, atrial fibrillation onset, when they've used non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. Many of us just don't have adequate antioxidant status. We eat very poorly. We, we eat very little live or real foods. We don't take quality supplementation. I'm not saying that antioxidants will stop your atrial fib, but in many cases, high stress, high catecholamine output. Maybe I'm taking some non-steroidals for my back. I, maybe I drink a little too much or maybe I don't drink at all and I just drink a ton of caffeine and I don't have the right nutrients supplementally, uh, you're at a much higher risk. When you have this kind of construct, you're gonna be at a higher risk for atrial fib long-term. Atrial fib, really, uh, uh, folks under 50, um, not really that big of a deal. Over 50, the rate ri rises. Over 80, significant link to folks at 80 and older. Um, is it just age? Is it just an age thing? I know a lot of the medical literature wants to just well, it's just an age thing. I, I don't think so. Um, I'm in my 50s. I've had bouts with AFib, so I understand this very, very well. And I'm telling you, a lot of it is lifestyle driven. Because, for example, I had no underlying issues. I have no heart disease of any type. Period at all. None. How how, how would I develop an incidence with AFib? driven by a lot of other factors, some genetic, but then these other confounding factors over the course of time. So then let's, let's just think about some other very um, common issues that I think we just miss. There's some literature showing that low copper status, imbalanced copper to zinc ratio, puts folks at a higher risk because you can't make a protective compound that the body's always trying to make called superoxide dismutase, SOD. Low copper opens the door. Many of you have low magnesium status. You, you eat poorly. You, you don't derive it from your diet. You don't supplement with an absorbable form of magnesium. Low magnesium status can open the door. Low potassium status certainly can open the door. Low essential fatty acids. You don't eat fish. You don't eat good fats. You don't eat nuts and seeds. And you don't supplement with a good oil. Imbalanced essential fatty acid ratio in the heart muscle can open the door 
as well. Some literature showing scant, but it's there, lowered vitamin D status. So the basics are eat well, change your diet, lose weight. If you don't have the, the disease state of the heart and you've had this, you've got to begin to look at how do I reduce the caffeine? I got to get off of these non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. I need to think about my alcohol intake. I need to supplement well with quality antioxidants. I need to maybe get on to a mag potassium, 100% fully ionized, absorbable form. I've got to take quality omegas, not some junk big box store version. Get a vitamin D level done. And then I would come back to this. What am I doing with my stress? How am I, how am I handling this? Do I work at managing stress? Am I doing anything that can help me manage my stress more efficiently? And if you're not, it can open the door because these catecholamines, unless we can reduce the, the calvary of, of, of these guys that are being sent into the heart because there are particular areas of the heart. Again, you could, you could have a diseased and a damaged heart. And that's what opens the door. If you do not, it's idiopathic, genetic. I'm not so sure that you just catch this. I'm not so sure that it's just age-driven. I think if you really do an analysis of the literature, there are a lot of other confounding factors. Well, AFib, I believe that's all we, we talked about. The meds that are used, um, two different types. Uh, there's more, but persistent AFib. Folks are in AFib all the time. Your physician, cardiologist can try to cardiovert you. You can have paroxysmal atrial fib, which means it's intermittent. It hits, it goes, it hits, it goes. Sometimes that goes to persistent AFib. Um, and electrophysiologists can go in and actually what they do is they actually ablate. It's called an ablation. They'll actually go in, like it actually pokes a hole in the, in the one portion of the, of the heart. And literally go in and they burn, cauterize, if you will, that area so that I showed you up here and make it less sensitive to the excessive stimulation. Very successful, some folks more success than others. Um, the other options are medications. Medications can work for a period of time. Sometimes over time they diminish in their effectiveness. Some of them do have side effects, the rhythm control meds versus the rate control. If you want some more advice, some more information, maybe from more from an integrative, not from a cardiology standpoint, maybe you're getting the cardiology side of this, Maybe you just need some other, like, what else can I do? This, can CoQ help me? What form of magnesium? What about omegas? Uh, you said something about copper. What, what about that? I heard copper is bad for you. But maybe you just need some more specific advice. You can go to our website, askjod.com. Uh, there's contact information. You can call, set up a consultation time. Maybe we can help you more integratively with your atrial fib. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for being with us. Visit uh, the YouTube site, Ask Joe DiMatteo. Tons of teaching up here for you. God bless you. Thanks for tuning in. I'll see you next time.